Great. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'm excited to be here and tell you about some things that are not exactly speech, but speech related. Um, so uh, specifically, speech and audio processing in non-invasive brain-computer interfaces at Meta, and a, a little bit about speech. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so you may have seen advertisements for these glasses recently. We came out with them in the fall. Um, the Ray-Ban Meta smart glasses. Um, so uh, they are are sort of a step towards uh, our goal of all day wearable, uh, immersive augmented reality glasses. Um, these are smart glasses, there's no display, but there's audio, um, there are cameras, there's a uh, meta, uh, meta AI that you can talk to. Um, the We also released um, the Quest 3, mixed reality headset. Um, it, basically, we, we wanna get, we're working towards this goal of uh, augmented reality glasses. Um, and to have, Augmented reality glasses, you don't want to walk around with a keyboard and a mouse. Um, you need uh, a natural, reliable, easy to use way to control them. So that is the neural interface that I'll be telling you about. Um, and we really see this as the next computing platform. Like there were there were desktops, there were laptops, there were phones. The, we think the next step is going to be uh, is AR glasses. Um, and uh, so yeah, let me tell you about them. And so just to give you a taste of this, uh, this is a video, uh, an excerpt from our Connect uh, presentation 2022, uh, end of the year. Um, so Zuck is using our neural interface here. You can see him wearing it on his wrist um, and he'll walk you through a little bit of what is we're thinking. Uh, it's a big uh, company-wide um, presentation from Reality Labs essentially, like all the, all the Reality Lab stuff that we're doing every year. Um, so here we go. We've talked a lot about neural interfaces in our research on EMG before, and we now have a working demo that lets you control an AR or VR device with motor neuron signals. Now, I'm not going to show you the headset this year, but here's what I'm seeing while I'm using this. Just the gentlest flick of my thumb to check my messages, and with another quick movement I can answer while I'm on the move. Uh, or I can even take a photo. Now the goal here is to make these interfaces faster, higher bandwidth, and a lot more natural. Uh, cool, so this is a research device that, that we use um, to collect signals, collect data, collect a lot of data, um, and, and to train these models that we can use uh, in, in things like this. Um, I've talked a lot about neural... Okay. Um, so that's the basic idea. So first of all, uh, this is sort of three parts of the talk. Uh, I'll tell you about um, just this signal, EMG, electromyography, like what, what is it? Um, where does it come from? What can we do with it? Um, and then I'll talk about a little bit about uh, ASR tools for EMG text interactions and interfaces. Uh, talk a little bit about beam forming for uh, EMG spike detection, um, which is an interesting problem that we can do identifying single neurons uh, non-invasively. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the glasses side and just some, some ways that we're collecting data uh, for multimodal egocentric uh, data sets and, and modeling. Um, cool, so risk-based EMG. Um, so you could consider this a brain machine interface um, that we're building. Um, most brain machine interfaces focus on the brain part of that. Um, and they try to record signals from the brain, um, you know, through uh, EEG or invasively. Um, the problem is that there's a lot going on in the brain. Um, and uh, really, if you think about it, that the, the only way that the brain can affect the world or really do anything is through uh, the spinal cord and through the peripheral nervous system, um, which is primarily controlling muscles. And so muscles are like the natural output of the brain. Um, and you might go so far as to say the only point of the brain is to control muscles. Um, and so what we're doing instead of trying to read from the brain is to read from the muscles so that we can get this natural output signal. It's much cleaner. Uh, it's much uh, it's much easier to interpret. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about what, what makes it up and why that is. Um, but uh, just to say that this is, this is what the brain is designed to do and we're just trying to read that natural output as opposed to trying to figure out what, what's going on inside someone's brain. Um, I mean, an important sort of corollary to this is that we're not reading your thoughts. 
we're just reading your intention to move your muscles, uh, which is the decision that you make. And so, um, you know, we think that has nice sort of privacy properties in that sense. Um, so the, the way that this signal actually works um, is that um, those, let's see, so the, these nerves that you see are actually made up of axons of lots of nerve fibers. Um, and the nerve fibers actually live, uh, the, 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 um, the nuclei of the cells uh, and the cell bodies actually live in the spinal cord. And it's a single axon that goes all the way out to whatever muscle it, you're, you're talking about. So, it, you know, we're talking tens of centimeters of uh, single, single cells, which is kind of crazy. Um, and so the way this works is that a single neuron, say this orange one, will uh, send out this axon and innervate a bunch of muscle fibers in one muscle. Um, and basically when that neuron fires, uh, all of those muscle fibers will fire and sort of amplify the nerve signal. Um, and so we can detect, we're measuring the signals primarily from the muscles uh, because of this amplification. Um, and so uh, let's see, one neuron will innervate many muscle fibers. Each muscle fiber just gets signal from one neuron. Um, and so each of these colored uh, collections of uh, muscle fibers here is one called motor unit, and they all act together um, and fire in concert. And so from our research device, um, this plot on the bottom is showing a one, one channel recording. From that, um, the blue is the actual recording, and then the red are peaks that we picked just in this, um, this one-dimensional signal. Uh, and if you line up all of the red dots together at the same time, um, you can see these different profiles emerge. Um, and so each of those different, we, we've colored them separately, but each, each one of those is one neuron that we're measuring using this device that's just sitting on your wrist. Um, and so uh, it's basically like the different heights of, of the peaks here. Um, so like if you group all of kind of these uh, uh, spikes together and then the second height and this third height, that's how you get the three different size neurons there, uh, size um, traces. Um, and so this is exciting. We can measure single neurons from your wrist. Um, and then the idea is that we're going to use those to control your devices, essentially. Um, so why why do this at the wrist? Um, this is this is a picture uh, called the motor homunculus. Um, it's it's basically so your your motor cortex is is in your brain about here, sort of a slice like this is what we're looking at. Um, and the way that it works is that it's laid out kind of spatially so that different parts of the motor cortex control different parts of your body. If you I think what Penfield and Rasmussen did was they they zapped different parts of brains and saw what moved what twitched. Um, and so you can see that a lot of it is the face, but a big chunk of it is the hand um, and and the fingers. Uh, especially, say, compare the size, the you know, sort of the amount of real estate that's devoted to the hand versus the foot. Um, it's it's much more. So uh, there's a lot of uh, the motor cortex devoted to the hand um, and uh, and the arm. And um, so we have a lot of brain real estate devoted to this. We have a lot of neurons devoted to this. Um, in addition, we have a lot of muscles uh, in the forearm that are controlling the hand. There's I don't know, twenty something, depending on how you count it. Um, but basically our hands are very dexterous. We can do many different things with them. We can learn uh, you know, various skilled motor activities to do with them. So there's both a lot of neurons controlling them and a lot of things to be controlled. Um, and so uh, the reason that the arm, the hand, the wrist is a good place to measure the CMG signal is because it's a very rich uh, space of signals, a very rich space of activities um, that, that we can have the person do and measure and respond to. Um, let me talk. So this is sort of a engineering model uh, of how this actually works. Um, I uh, I'll go through it. Can, can I ask a yeah, yeah. Any question? Sure. So the picture that you had the red blue green spike. Yes. Uh, so you said that you're basically picking up on the activity in the neuron. Yes. But the neuron obviously causes the muscle to twitch, and there's probably a lot of signal. Like that, I'm wondering okay, whether that signal isn't much bigger. This is yeah. the electrical magnitude. So we're we're measuring the muscle signal. Well, you're uh, the muscle. So yeah. Inferring that it's the neuron, not that the measurement. 
Correct. Well, the so this particular the, the junction between the neuron and the muscle fibers is much more reliable than other neural junctions, like between uh, two neurons. So when the neuron fires, the muscle fiber always fires. So it's a very reliable shape. It's always the same shape. So you're getting that the junction. Muscle. Yeah, I mean we're picking it up from the muscle, but it's it's basically the amplifying the 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 neural. The, the signal from the neuron. Uh, any, any other questions? Refer to it. Um, so this one has 16. Any questions? I don't know if they're going to talk about this later, but now asking about the sensor like that, I understand like, is this like, um, uh, generalized to anyone, or do you need to train the person? Because, of course, like the position of those sensors might influence the neuron that you're. Uh, so, I guess we need to train for a little bit of time to that person. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it, it'll sort of come up throughout the okay. talk. Um, I, I mean, so like this particular, like these particular shapes on this particular channel would just be for one recording, even if this person took the band off and put it back on. It would probably show up differently because it's it's in a different place. Um, that's actually kind of what I, what I wanted to get at here um, is just that you know there's there's behavioral differences between people, there's physiological differences between uh, people, and and then there's measurement differences. And so all of these you know this is sort of all feeding into variation in the signal that we're ultimately measuring. Um, the, the the basic way that that this all works is that. Um, you know, you you think I want to I want to do something, and then your brain computes. Okay, that means that these muscles need to do need to activate this much, and it generates these muscle excitation signals that gets translated into spikes. So, um, in order for a muscle to generate more force, it generates a lot of these spikes. The neurons fire, and the motor units go, and they and they tell it to um, to generate a lot of force. Um, those get involved with those shapes that we saw to create uh, the actual signals that we're going to measure um, from each motor unit. And then when we actually measure them, they get mixed together because we only have a finite number of sensors. Um, so this this big mixing matrix, this volume conductor, um, is is something that we don't really know, but we try to try to figure out to to be able to tie the signals that we're measuring uh, back to the individual motor units, the individual muscles, um, and and eventually these sort of activation primitives that um, we're trying to figure out. Um, and so if you if you change uh, to get at the, even if it's the same behavior, um, we could be measuring differently because the band's in a different place or the, the particular individual could have different um, physiology, anatomy. And so we might be picking things up differently. So those are big sources of variation that we want to try to generalize across. Um, any, any questions about? Um, so let's see, here's uh, another video, just uh, sort of a demonstration of some of the different uh, gestures that we can train a model to recognize. Um, so you see the, the person's wearing the band, they're doing different things, and each of these uh, buttons here is sort of lighting up if they do a particular gesture. So we've, we've done some supervised learning and trained the model recognize uh, index pinches, middle pinches, uh, pinky squeeze, index squeeze, uh, different wrist rolls. Um, and uh, the, the, so the, the basic idea here is that, you know, supervised learning works pretty well. Um, I don't know, I think this might be a model that works across people. I think this might be a, a, a model that generalizes across people um, and, and across sessions, taking the band off, putting it back on. Um, but basically if you can, if you can come up with something that you want someone to do and collect a bunch of data using it, you can train a supervised model to, to recognize it. Um, the, yeah, I'll, I'll make a distinction later between sort of biomimetic gestures and, and other gestures. So th these are things that, you know, this is like an index pinch is something you can explain to someone to do. Um, but we can detect things um, such as those individual spikes, which don't actually move your joints at all because there's just such a small force. Um, 
And so we can do things beyond just these biomimetic gestures. Which is the exciting part of this question? I'm just wondering whether uh, this has promise for sign language recognition as well. Um, I think so, yeah. I mean, um, certainly hand gestures, any kind of hand hand shapes. I think sign language also involves facial expressions for prosody. It does also provide the position of your hand, uh, which maybe this is not picked up, like it doesn't know if you're making the gesture over here or over here. So uh, that you need to look at muscles farther up the arm in order to catch that or be able to be more than you are. Yeah, I mean, so we're um, for the EMG, we don't know sort of where you're doing it. We do have a you know, gyroscope and, and accelerometer in the band. So we, we can tell how you move your hands around generally. Um, so I, I think it, I think it could work for that. Um, uh, you know, it's certainly something that that we're thinking about, but um, don't have, not sort of actively investigating it right now, but uh, I think it would be promising for it. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, this is part um make sure I'm understanding this, the EMG would be in the consumer device. It's not just something you're measuring in order to train cheaper sensors. Uh, correct, yeah. 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 What, can you say anything about the price point? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, accessible, we want to make, we want to make technology accessible to, to, to the general public, so uh, not, not too expensive, but. <laughs> um, any, any other questions? Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, cool. So yeah, in terms of that um, kind of biomimetic versus beyond the biomimetic uh, discussion, um, you can think sort of about in abstract terms about the bandwidth of um, the control capacity of of the system of, of various stages in the system. So um, you know, the brain has millions and billions of neurons. They're operating at say 100 hertz. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a big control capacity there. Um, that gets transduced into, say, a thousand motor neurons per muscle operating at 50 hertz. Um, so still substantial control capacity, but obviously less. Um, so the EMG signal contains the motor cortex's intent to act and move muscles. Um, what actually moves the muscles, it's like each muscle moves at, say, five hertz. So it's significantly lower bandwidth um, than the, this neural signal that we're measuring. Um, and so there's a lot of filtering that happens, sort of the muscles act and, and the joints act as a low pass filter. Um, so we lose a lot of that control capacity. So th this is what, you know, if you're, if you're doing biomimetic control, if you're doing things like pinches, then that's, that's something that your hands can do um, naturally. And so that sort of fits in that smaller uh, box there. But, um, you know, there's, there's all this sort of accessible neuromotor information that's not being used to actually control your hands. And so, um, we see that as uh, sort of an opportunity uh, to use, to just give people new feedback signals such that they can um, uh, you know, learn to do new things and have new skills without disrupting the, you know, the skills that they do with their hands naturally. So um, I think a big promise of the technology is that we can uh, do this sort of motor augmentation and uh, give people extra abilities and that, that they don't currently have. Yeah. With your physical body. Um, okay. Um, cool. So that's sort of it for the EMG basics. Is anyone anyone any other questions about about that before we talk about some of the applications here? Okay. Um, so first, let me talk about uh, ASR tools for EMG text uh, interfaces. So here is a demo of uh, someone touch typing on a desk. So basically they're wearing one of our wristbands on each hand, each wrist, and typing as if they were touch typing on a keyboard. Um, so do that again. Uh, we can transcribe what they would have been typing if they had been typing on a keyboard, um, so without a keyboard. Um, and so this particular model was trained for this particular person, collected, you know, several hours of data from them typing on a real keyboard. We have nice ground truth because we have the the keys that they actually typed. Um, but with that, we can we can train this model that uh, that that works pretty well. Um, you could see other things like where we could use language models to make corrections, uh, correct the model errors. Um, we could use language models to correct 
uh, human errors, uh, if the human sort of mistypes, um, we could fix it like on your phone. Um, and uh, so this is sort of the, the basics of a text interface for EMG. Um, and if you think about it, this is a lot like the ASR problem. We have these for continuous signals coming in uh, in streaming fashion. We want to output characters. Um, so uh, we can use a lot of the same tools as uh, ASR. Um, you have sort of spectral features. This is this is actually speech, not our real features. Um, but it goes into neural network. We use CTC loss to to train it, um, and and out come characters. Um, you know, there's there's a few um, there's a few differences. Which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but we can use speech uh, architectures, data augmentations, language models, um, losses. Um, you know. Uh, some interesting problems are generalization and data efficient personalization. Um, these are things that we're, that we're working on. Um, you know, something that we weren't quite sure about when we started uh, was how 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 much you could train a model on one person's EMG signals and they would generalize to someone else's EMG signals because um, the the fine details of the EMG signals are specific to an individual. Whereas for speech, you actually have to communicate to another person; they have to hear you. Um, for EMG, you're just controlling your muscles and your joints. And so it could potentially be the case that, that it was very different across subjects. We found good generalization to new subjects given enough data. Um, and so uh, you know, we, we've been pleasantly surprised that we don't need to do a lot of personalization to, um, to make this work. Um, so um, you know, as, to get a little more specific, um, we have, uh, you know, obviously, if, if you're treating this as a keyboard, um, then we need low latency. It needs to act like a keyboard output letters um, quickly. Um, uh, you know, and so we're, we're using a bunch of uh, these, these related ASR techniques. Um, you know, there's some differences in that it's a multi-channel signal. Um, so we have to deal with that. Uh, decoder should support modifying history. Like if you hit the backspace key, we need to sort of factor that into any language modeling and things like that. Um, so there's a little, little bit of wrinkle there. Um, and, you know, generalization is hard, harder, um, and there's different, different gender process. Um, I think one thing that's different um, in particular is the amount of noise. There's really not a lot of noise. Like the, the signal that you saw is very uh, high SNR. Like we're measuring the neural signal that's there, but the the real challenge is not in uh, overcoming noise, but in generalizing across behaviors, across people, across um, uh, you know other other kinds of variability that's in there. So we can measure it well, but it, we need to generalize across it. Um, so to be a little more quantitative, um, we have uh, here's here's a data set that we have a small one. Um, but uh, so here, each each column is a user, um, and each sort of block is a, a data set from them. Uh, it's a few minutes long, um, and so we have a few different ways of of slicing and dicing these results, training models. Um, in particular, uh, you could imagine training just on the green data and then testing on the red data. Um, so that's this generic no personalization result. Um, and I'm giving a relative performance here, but relative to the best performance, it's like six times worse than that if you if you just try to generalize from the green to the red. Um, if you train on the orange and then test on the corresponding red sessions, it does much better. Uh, it's like only twice as bad as our best system. Um, but if you train on the green and then fine tune on the orange and then test on the red, we do even better. So that's down to 1.4 times. If you then add a language model, so we just have a six gram character language model that we're using here, um, that's when you get to our best performance, which is this uh, personalized fine tuned model. The second line is just training on one of the orange versus the right? Yes. Compared to the line above that, it is training on all the green stuff. Yes. So, in some sense, that's indicative of how much the gap is between non personalized and like multiple like seven. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, as the green data gets bigger and bigger, this gap 
shrinks, yes. Um, but uh, but for this amount of data, uh, which is you know a few hundred hours, um, it it yeah this is this is what we're seeing. So the last line, the one where you see fine tuning, mm -hmm. have you done it with let's say just one of the blue orange bits rather than the bricks rather than the whole vertical part? Uh, what I'm thinking is get somebody to enroll by typing a standard sentence of English to the front of it. Yeah. Um, you can do that. I mean, so the different orange blocks, the people take off the band and put it back on, so it gives some robustness to the band placement. Um, but uh, yeah, if you, if you if you have pre-trained on a lot of data ahead of time, then you you could personalize it with just a little bit of data um, subsequently. So yeah, the, the for the random minute, you would want to have more of the orange, but. In fact, I'm thinking that the more favorable setting that I put the band on and I type this kind of sentence, and then I continue. So in fact, for that session, the positioning is also different. Right. Yeah, if you wanted to do it for that, yeah, you could just certainly do that, yeah. I'm just talking mm -hmm. about the original IBM and Dragon dictation system, which is enrolled in the session. Right, right, right. You have to read, you know, several pages of, of uh, text. Yeah, or something. not that. <laughs> Ten minutes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you could do that. I mean, I think, you know, a better experience would be you just put it on and it works, but certainly there, you know, it, it would be possible to have some sort of enrollment and, and some sort of, you know, start playing around with it. Here's you know, maybe within the tutorial, here's how you use it. And in the background, we're pointing in the model or something. Um, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about, about beam forming for uh, EMG spike detection. Um, so, uh, you know, I showed you this before. Um, we can detect these individual waveforms. Um, you know, this signal is pretty favorable to doing this because there really are only three neurons happening at the same time here. Um, you know, if we have 16 sensors and I said that there's a thousand motor units per muscle and there's 20 muscles. So, you know, we, we're very much undersampling uh, the, the space of uh, sort of spatially um, these signals that we want to measure. And so, um, you know, the, the more we're able to look across channels, um, the more we can try to uh, infer, you know, more, we can identify more motor units, more neurons and, and try to uh, decompose the signal into uh, into a set of spikes. So um, how can we do that? One way um, is using uh, beamforming techniques. Uh, we found NVDR works pretty well. Um, and so uh, basically here we have a mixture. I'm not showing the mixture, but this is the ground truth for one simulated neuron. Uh, we're mixing it with, I think, five or six other neurons um, and uh, measuring it on, say, five channels. Um, so you, you might think that you could do something like match filtering, where you, even if you know the shape of the neuron, you sort of flip around and evolve it with the, um, uh, with the measured signal. You can see that there's a lot of crosstalk from the other neurons. So this is um, crosstalk from a different one. All, all of these sort of sub, sub threshold spikes uh, are crosstalk from other neurons. If we use MVDR, we, we sort of whiten away those. Um, so using the statistics of the channels and, and uh, time delayed versions of them, um, we can uh, we can filter the signal and uh, just detect this particular target neuron. So you can see that all the all the crosswalk is gone and we're just getting um, these signals. So um, this is what we can do if we if we know what shapes we're looking for. So essentially uh, starting from starting from here where we've got these shapes, the question is, you know, how can we get these shapes? Um, so here's another video from that same uh, Connect talk. Here, the algorithm is learning in real time how to respond to the EMG signals the person is sending with only the slightest of hand movements. The system is recognizing the actions the person has decided to perform by decoding those signals at their wrist and translating them into digital commands. And now the person is able to communicate their intended actions to the computer with almost no hand movement. This is a genuine transformation in the way we interact with the digital world. Um, so that was showing a little bit how, how we can refine the shape of the of the neuron of the neural signal and uh, identify it. 
Um, I don't know if you noticed in the video, I can play it again, but there's two arrows at the top and persons essentially learn to use two separate motor units, one uh, to make the cat go one way and the other to make the cat go the other way. And so if you, if you look at the hand, the hand's not moving, but these two motor units are activating and they're doing it volitionally to control the cat going back up. So let me, let me play that again and you can see more closely. Here, the algorithm is learning in real time how to respond to the EMG signals the person is sending with only the slightest of hand movements. The system is recognizing the actions the person has decided to perform by decoding those signals at their wrist and translating them into digital commands. And now, the person is able to communicate their intended actions to the computer with almost no hand movement. This is a genuine transformation in the way we interact with the digital world. Um, so, you know, that, that's sort of the promise of this is that you can do this control without visible movement. You can do it, you know, sort of privately, subtly, um, and, uh, you know, and that we can detect these, these very fine movements um, using the CMT signal. So, so in the uh, demo we just saw, um, it was learning somehow, but presumably adapting uh, an existing model uh, to this particular uh, particular user, um, but it already had some vocabulary and motions that it was trying to classify. Um, yeah. Essentially. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't discovering some set of motions. These are, uh, you know, you could go left or right in this case, you know, maybe there's a few other things. How was the original model training before it was adapted to this user? Like, where does the supervision come from? Well, really, it, it just starts from... Um, you know, it, it starts from sort of a clustering process like this. So it's just, it's, it's unsupervised. It's detecting, here's a bunch of things that I think could be spikes. Um, for this particular user, for this particular setup. Um, and then it goes through that refinement process where it's adjusting. Sorry. It's going through that uh, refinement process where it's adjusting what it what it thinks of that particular spike. So there's, I think, a clustering and then a selection process. You know, the user can say, I want to use that one. There must be some supervision that, uh, you know, that particular uh, green thing actually needs to go left, whereas uh, the red trajectory is going to go right. Yeah, there's sort of a manual, okay, I want to use that one for left, and I want to use that one for right. So, so is there a process where you basically tell them, uh, please rock left, rock left, now rock right, right? Uh, in other words, you're telling them to do particular things, uh, not not for this particular user, maybe for right. the general model, that then gets adapted to you? Well, the, the mapping is more abstract in that you can, you know, it, it could be that you're just, you know, flexing your index finger, and that generates two different spikes, uh, and you assign spike number one to be left and spike number two to be right. Like it doesn't have to be a spatial mapping of I'm moving left so that the, that that generates. But yeah, but you know, it's spatial. I mean, there's some finite vocabulary of gestures. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of clusters that you get, and you need some supervision to align the uh, the the gestures to the clusters so that you can pass them to the game. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and but but you know there are many neurons. That we could detect, and so um, you know, th there's a big space of these possible mappings that, that you could set up. Um, so I mean, you know, I think part of the design of the system is to make this an easy process and not onerous for the user. We don't, you know, obviously we don't want to talk to people about this neuron and that neuron and you know, connect it to that thing. So you know, we need to do a lot more handholding, but this is a nice proof of concept that it's even possible to do. And so you think it will be possible uh, to train on users at Meta, and then nobody has to go through a training procedure uh, at the real world because uh, you can do it all by adaptation. That's a good question. Um, that's our hope. Um, I mean, you know, th this particular work is is pretty far out in the future, and so um, you know, we're still very much in the kind of basic research phase of it. Um, but, uh, you know, eventually for a product, we would like it to be as easy to use as possible. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, here. I think there's just one more little video of, um, this spike detection. So the spike here is, is connected to, um, making the, the dino jump and dino runner. Um, 
so you can see that it works in different postures. You can hold your, you know, as as he's moving his uh, arms around, it's still working, um, still able to to control the same spike. And you also notice that he's not visibly moving to actually make the dino jump. It's cool. Um, I think it was so just, just, for us to... just for you to know that that's what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, let me skip this part. Um, I mean, to, to summarize this part, um, basically, you know, even though there are lots of neurons and we could potentially measure them all separately, in in natural movement, we don't control them as completely independent degrees of freedom. Essentially, the motor units are recruited in a specific order and then de-recruited de -recruited in a similar order. And so muscles generally have one degree of freedom. This is showing that there was good evidence from the 60s that Given the right feedback, you can learn other things. You can learn more degrees of freedom. You can learn to uh, control these motor units more independently, uh, either in terms of uh, in a different ordering like that, or in terms of sort of precise control of the number of times that a motor unit fires. Um, people can learn to do that. And so we think that, you know, that this is what makes us hopeful about those extra degrees of freedom, that extra um, control that you can have. And uh, I'll show this quickly, but. Um, this is just an example where someone on our team, an expert, learned to uh, control two motor units from the same muscle independently and could hit a target uh, going one way or the other. It's a little hard to see, but there's a there's a blue neuron and a red neuron um, that uh, have very similar shapes, but can be controlled independently to move the, um, the ring towards a particular target. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the promise of this is, uh, reading this latent neuromotor bandwidth and teaching users to control it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a sensing problem. It's a tracking problem, uh, over time and over uh, posture. Um, if we could identify sort of like where natural movement lives in the space, could we then go away from that and not disturb the natural movement? Um, and then can we help people you know, in this process of motor learning? and neuromotor control of, of learning to do new things, like learning to play the piano, learning to ride a bicycle, um, learning to uh, serve a tennis ball. Um, these are all skills that you learn to do. There's a lot of refinement. Current current uh, techniques for coaching involve, you know, say for tennis serve, which is an example I'm, I'm taking from uh, a professor here at my car cover. Um, but, uh, you know, you serve a tennis ball, it goes in where you're uh, aiming or it doesn't. And you, that's a very sort of long feedback loop. And it doesn't really tell you how should I move differently such that the ball goes to the right place. So if we could provide more feedback, more immediate feedback, um, as you're doing the movement, uh, that could help you do the right thing and learn to do it more quickly and you know, be better at this skill. Um, and so the, you know, EMG gives us the opportunity to do that. Uh, to give that close feedback loop and say, if you're learning to type, if you're learning to do other things, can we really compress the time scale that, that the learning takes by giving you this uh, faster feedback? Um, cool. So let me talk briefly about um, more speech related things that are less EMG related, um, but uh, egocentric speech data sets for air glasses. Um, so uh, this is basically the glasses side of this glasses and uh, control um, uh, pairing. And so if you see here, there's a chessboard that is a virtual object inserted into the real world. This is uh, one, one vision of where we're going with AR glasses that you could put virtual objects into the real world um, in a world locked sense. Um, you know, we're getting there uh, slowly um, and in baby steps, but sort of this is, this is where we want to go. Um, and one part of that is um, is just making 
egocentric recordings, making recordings from glasses like this. Um, you know, the glasses have lots of sensors, they have uh, cameras, they have microphone arrays. Um, so collecting a lot of data uh, of these egocentric actions uh, such that we can build AIs that understand them, understand what's going on, understand the context uh, that you are in, they see what you see, they hear what you hear. Um, how can they best provide you with useful information? Um, and so you can see from this initial video that, um, you know, it's, there's a lot going on. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really feel like your, uh, your experience of the world where, you know, you look around and, and everything stays in one place, but here the camera's moving and it's hard to follow exactly where things are. There's some blurring, there's, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to follow. So, um, you know, how can we do something useful with this? How can we process this? Um, let's see, we have these Project ARIA glasses um, that we uh, created. They're not a, a prototype, they're a research device. They let us uh, collect data. There's a microphone array, there's cameras, there's other sensors. Um, and the idea is to collect a lot of this egocentric data um, so that we can train these models and eventually deploy them to the real thing. Um, we do have uh, academic partners. You can get some, you can make some recordings, you can get the data, um, you can uh, you know, build models. Um, we are working on a time challenge based on some of this data. Um, it should be available relatively soon, um, but it's uh, conversational data between partners um, wearing these glasses. Uh, there's there's head movement. Uh, we we're we're trying to you know, sort of the first of hopefully several uh, egocentric data sets of this kind that will help us build models, help everyone build models um, that can run on on AR glasses. Um, cool. So to conclude, um, you know, generally the bandwidth of input to humans has been growing, but the output from humans has been not growing as quickly. So we are hoping that uh, neuromotor interfaces allow us to expand that human output bandwidth and uh, and hopefully catch up. Um, if this sounds interesting, reach out to me. Come come work with us. Come uh, come help out. We have uh, we're still hiring for summer interns, um, and hopefully hiring for full time research scientists soon. Um, the internships are sort of a joint pool between the speech teams and the EMG teams. So if you're interested in speech internships, also reach out. Um, I think we're hiring sort of across speech and, and EMG in general for full-time uh, as well, but that's still a little bit up in there. Um, so thank you for your attention.